Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is a share and learn session on Pride Outside of Pride, produced by Tech Talent Charter and kindly supported by one of our signatories and principal partners, Lloyds Banking Group. My name is Lexi Papaspiru and I'm a product director at Tech Talent Charter. My pronouns are she, her. Um, by way of introduction, I'm sure a lot of you are already uh, members of the Tech Talent Charter, but uh, for anyone who is new to the Tech Talent Charter, we are an industry-led and government-supported not-for-profit, and we work with over 800 UK organisations to promote and improve diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. Um, these share and learn sessions are an opportunity uh, for companies to learn from one another about how different organisations are tackling certain areas of diversity and inclusion. And today we are hearing from Lloyds Banking Group, um, who have previously uh, been recognised for their work in this area by Stonewall as a top employer for LGBTQ plus inclusion, and whose Rainbow Employee Network have also previously been voted the number one um, LGBT network. Um, and they will be sharing with us how they do things at, at Lloyds today. Um, please feel free to use the chat to ask them questions because we have a fantastic group um, of folks from the organisation who can share their experiences um, with everyone on the call today. Um, please uh, do keep yourself muted until we open up for questions though, but do feel free to use that chat. So um, before I bring in um, one of our first speakers from Lloyd's, I'd like to just set the scene a little. So when we talk about pride, many people will think about celebration, parade. And that's certainly part of it, but it's important that we don't reduce the idea of LGBTQ plus inclusion just to this idea of celebration that happens once a year and you know companies do a little bit of pink washing or rainbow washing and then that's it. Because pride in its origins is rooted in, in protest and resistance to injustice and harm that has been done to the LGBTQ plus communities um, in society through history. And though there's undoubtedly been progress since like the late 60s and the Stonewall riots, we need to recognise that we are not there yet when it comes to making sure that our society is truly inclusive. And it takes deep and intentional effort to make change. So Tech Talent Charter is actually for the first time um, releasing some new insight in our annual diversity and tech report, which is due for release in February, um, sharing the latest stats on non-binary and trans representation, specifically in UK tech. And let me tell you, having worked on this data, um, that we're going to be releasing soon, it is a shocker. And that's just one lens of this. But if we look at, you know, wider data sets that are available um, from the ONS, for example, looking at things like hate crimes in the last two years, there have been significant increases in the number of reported hate crimes against the LGBTQ plus community. So this is still very much a problem. It is not something that happens somewhere else, but it's, it's a problem that leaders of our businesses and the tech industry need to be thinking about and working on in context. And, you know, we mentioned things like hate crimes here, and, and that's a, a very, you know, a violent and dramatic end of the scale of where, where harm is being done. But there are also issues within our businesses that are insidious and do also need to be accounted for. And that's one of the reasons why we're talking about this um, with, you know, with such passion today, as you'll see from the speakers we have. Um, a stat that really stood out to me is one from Vodafone that came out a few years ago that one in three people in the LGBTQ plus community who have previously been out have actually decided to reverse being open about their orientation after starting their first job. There are other really interesting stats that focus on this in context of companies like a McKinsey study that highlights that the more junior a person is in their role, the less likely they are to be out at work and women are less likely to be out than men. So there are some really interesting cuts of looking at this problem um, that we need to be aware of as we go into these conversations today. And if we're going to really create inclusive workspaces where employees can thrive, we need to ensure that employees feel comfortable to be their authentic selves um, and, and, and feel safe to bring their full selves to work and not just when they've already made it. Um, you know, we need to be looking at this across our entire workforce at all levels. Um, so to make sure that we're, we're looking at the more nuanced facets of this problem, I'd love to hand over to our first speaker today from, from Lloyds Banking Group, uh, which is Craig Anderson, who's the people and uh, the people partner for Data and Tech, um, who's going to be exploring a little bit more some of the stats around what's happening when we look at representation in the tech industry for LGBTQ plus folks. So I'll hand over to you, Craig. 
Perfect. Thank you, Lexi, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. So as Lexi mentioned, my name is Craig Anderson, and my name, my pronouns are he and him. I form part of the People Partnering team um, at Lloyds Banking Group, supporting the tech and data businesses. And I must say, you know, every day is a school day, um, you know, operating in that space. Um, personally, I'm married to Colin, um, and we have a six-year-old son. Um, so I am, you know, a gay dad and exploring that every day. Um, so we wanted to begin today's session by trying to add some context. Firstly, relating to the size of the LGBTQ community across the UK and also within the tech sector. And for the avoidance of doubt, when I use those letters, we're talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer identifying people. So according to the ONS, 3.2% of the total UK population aged 16 and over identify as lesbian, gay or bisexual in 2023 and 0.5% did not identify with the sex that they had registered at birth, which equates to over a quarter of a million people. When looking at the tech community specifically, data is more difficult to find, and one of the most recent reports comes from 2019. So according to Hire.com in its inaugural 2019 UK Tech Equality Report, 8% of UK tech workers define themselves as LGBTQ. LGBTQ, yes, and you can see more specific numbers on the screen. Um, I was going to mention earlier, um, you know, within our community, we use quite a lot of letters and I was going to almost say a quip at the start about getting tripped over them. Um, so I've done it quite early in my presentation, so apologies for that. Um, but there is also a frustrating lack of um, data on LGBTQ people working in UK tech. So, for example, recent data showed that approximately 20% of people working in tech are women and 80% are men. There's no more figures on non-binary people and tech talent charters latest report find that only 35% of companies are measuring non-binary gender diversity at the moment. So we know that the demography of the UK is constantly changing with approximately 12% of university students today who are gender fluid or on the trans spectrum and 22% of, of the UK student population identify as LGBTQ. So let's think about representation um, of LGBTQ people across the STEM industry then. So a new study in 2022 by the Institute of Engineering and Technology, so the IET, has found that a third of LGBTQ people avoid careers in science, technology and engineering due to worries of discrimination and bullying. The study discovered that subjects such as science, technology and engineering have an image problem which prevents LGBTQ people from pursuing a career in that industry. Okay, can we just move on this slide? Should, and the next one, please, sorry. Okay, so as the tech industry has been male dominated for such a long time, research tells us that there is a perception of a programmer culture in some tech companies. And as a result of this, risks of homophobic bullying and outdated attitudes among some male dominated communities in tech can affect LGBTQ people negatively, making them feel unable to come out or be their authentic selves at work. It's easier to imagine that these perceptions are not based in reality. Surely the world has moved on to be more accepting and inclusive, right? Well, there are some stats that show that lived experiences of people working in the tech industry and the fact that it may not always be as inclusive as we would hope for members of the LGBT community. A study by the IET last year found that 33% of gay engineers felt that their sexuality was a barrier to career progression. 53% of LGBTQ tech workers heard jokes about gay and lesbian people at least once at work and 1.5% of LGBTQ employees reported to have been told to dress either more masculine or feminine. So as an industry, are we really as inclusive to the LGBTQ community as we would like to be? We know that the world can feel particularly hostile right now, but we have an amazing opportunity to make our places of work safe havens, places where colleagues can authentically be themselves. And we know that when that happens, people perform at their best. So if we could just move on to the next slide. So we wanted to start today by sharing some of the research around the challenges we face in our industry, but we also want today to be about hope and positivity. So whilst we know there may be an image problem for tech within the lesbian, gay and bisexual communities, anecdotally, we hear from some of our trans and non-binary colleagues that tech, data and more analytical careers are seen as welcoming communities for gender diverse people. 
So trans and non-binary people may actually be more present in tech careers than, and, than in other industries. However, there is a frustrating lack of data to allow us to qualify this. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. So we want to share some examples of how Lloyds Banking Group has addressed some of the challenges faced by the LGBTQ community and how we are working to create an inclusive environment. So we know that true LGBTQ inclusion is much more than attending pride events, putting out rainbow flags, setting up an employee resource group and leaving it to the community themselves to take it from there. We must all lean in and, and offer tangible allyship and that is what we really want to talk about today. We all want to be transparent and say right from the start that whilst we are proud of what we have achieved at Lloyds Banking Group, we don't have all the answers. And we are also on a continually evolving journey because the world just doesn't stand still. But we are very happy to share what we have been up to um, and what we have been learning along the way. So with that in mind, I'm delighted to now hand over to Anthony Francis, Anthony Francis where Anthony will talk to you about the Rainbow Network, its purpose and its structure. Thanks for that, Craig. And uh, yeah, morning, everyone. So as Craig mentioned, my name is Anthony Francis um, so at Lloyds. I'm the EA, so Exec Assistant to our Chief Technology Officer. Um, and also one of the things that I do side of desk or a job, as we say, is I am on the Rainbow Network Steering Committee. So currently, I've just picked up a new role looking at intersectionality and how we work across the broader group to bring sort of our networks together and, and look at that. Um, Craig mentioned about slipping up on LGBT and LGBTQ plus and so on. I'm sure I am going to do the same. Um, and maybe in the slides, you'll see kind of like different terms of where we're using that because we as a network actually and as an organization have just started shifting to the LGBTQ plus. Um, so we're still kind of like adjusting, adjusting ourselves to that terminology. Um, I'll just touch on two things. I think just on this intro slide, you'll see the Lloyd's logo. Next there, we've got a hashtag, we are rainbow, um, which is our, um, momentum I forget I forget what it is now but it's kind of like our thing that we are kind of championing all throughout the year and we kind of using it as our hashtag throughout the year and um, before that we used the hashtag always proud um, which Lexi touched on earlier I guess in terms of making sure that pride is a theme or LGBTQ plus inclusion is a theme throughout the whole year which is why our sort of marketing teams came up with hashtag always proud um, and lastly that hashtag LBG with the T um, is all around Lloyds Banking Group standing with our trans community um, to make sure that we champion sort of those throughout everything that we do because recognising that you know this year last year um, and in recent times it's a really um, difficult time and challenging time for, for some of that community so we really want to make sure that we're really visible with that um, and LBG being LBG really confuses everyone because that's Lloyds Banking Group it's kind of like we get a bit confused there so it just messes things up a little bit so um, if we move on a little bit then just in terms of Rainbow itself as as a network and our purpose. So really everything we're around, so we're a professional development network. So everything that we do really should be around how we um, develop our colleagues professionally. So whether that be access to information and people, different training resources and things like that, that's really what we're about. And it's making sure that Lloyd's itself is inclusive for LGBTQ plus people, but also how we can use our wider impacts on things externally as well. So I can bring that to life a little bit um in, in a while but we break down to sort of three areas so one from a colleague perspective so making sure you know our colleagues are really enjoying coming to work and it's a place where they can feel safe and thrive regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity the second element is around customer so you know we are an organization with I think almost um, 30 million customers we have a really big presence in the UK so that means we have a really diverse um you know, set of customers that are, that are engaging with us and want to make sure that they feel represented in what we are about as an organisation. So it's really important that we, as a network, can help Lloyds with that and achieve that and be the voice of some of our customers at moments that matter. And then lastly, that community element. So Lloyds is all around helping Britain prosper and it's not just a cheesy tagline, they really do mean it. And we as a network want to really embrace that and understand how we can work with charities um, to, to help them in different ways. And, and again, I'll touch on that in a little bit more, but they're the three areas um, that we focus on. If I move on to the next slide as well, what's really important for us is making sure that Lloyd's, Rainbow as a network is aligned to our overall what Lloyd's is trying to achieve. Um, it's no point us just kind of going off and doing one thing um, and Lloyd's is trying to achieve another. 
So Rainbow really get behind that. So you'll see our values as an organization at the bottom. And um, that is not a trade secret. I think we're on the website, so it's all right to be on this slide. Um, but really the network is all about driving these different things. And at the top, you'll see some words and that we put that I went through, I won't read through all of those. Um, but you'll see it's kind of all around our purpose being inclusive and really trying to make sure that what we're doing is representative of the colleagues colleagues and customers that we're serving. Um, so that is what everything that Rainbow is trying to, to achieve. And we're making sure that finance is a force for good. Um, so if I move on to the next slide then and just bring some of this to life in terms of what we are as a network are doing. And I think one of the things before I start, Rainbow is on the Rainbow has been around now as a network for around 12 years. Um, so when I read through some of the stuff here, some some people might find that overwhelming and think, wow. I don't even know how to create a spreadsheet to sign people up and if that's against GDPR or whatever it may be that like we have been there I think in the um in some of the guides and information that tech Town tried to have it kind of touch, touches on things right from the beginning and, and everyone is free to reach out to me or anyone else from lawyers on this call just to talk about some of the early stages if that if that is where you are um but for us just talking through what we've been doing in 2023 really highlights some of the stuff that makes sure that activity is happening throughout the whole year so for our year, really what we want to do is make sure that we're building momentum. Um, and that's where the hashtag we are rainbow came from. Um, and our aims have been around, like I say, create an environment where everyone feels they belong, that belonging is really key. Also growing a community of both LGBTQ plus colleagues and allies. I think it's, that visibility is really important to make sure that everyone kind of can be able to see someone that they can connect to and know they're not alone. There's been elements where we just provide general general knowledge um, but also you know we as a community kind of act as SMEs to our wider group to make sure that we are they're doing things right to make sure we're challenging in the right way and to make sure that the group is moving forward and I guess one way we can as a network we can exploit them a little bit to to make sure we are doing good and we're kind of trying to achieve our purpose and aims a really key thing for us as well this year has been around personal development and us doing that so um, someone who leads our professional development, James Wynne Stanley, he, held, he holds at least one professional development call each month to be able to, for people to join and whether that be on presentation, presenting skills, whether it be on, you know, tidying up your CV or how to broaden things, that's something that we as a network are really, really behind um, and you, you kind of see it in our logo. Um, and then that last point, you know, you're leveraging our voice to kind of influence things internally and also externally. So, there are things I mentioned around sort of trans inclusion. There are things that we've done to various points throughout the year, um, including, say, at Pink News Awards, where we try to use that to really influence what is happening both internally and externally. In terms of some of the things that how we've achieved that then, so firstly, our role models guide. So we have a yearly an annual role model guide, which um, it's actually something that I kicked off as part of the Rainbow Network maybe four years ago now, four or five years ago. And it really showcases LGBTQ plus people um, and our allies that are driving inclusion. So anyone should be able to look at this guide, to see, see themselves there somewhere, um, as in someone like them there, um, aspire to be on there, but also there are around 50 people in there that anyone can reach out to at any point in time to say, hi, I just want to chat, or hi, I'm stuck with this, or hi, I'm having this problem. You know, so that's key for us to be able to do that. We also focus on the local stuff. So we recognise that sometimes it's really easy for, you know, I, I'm based out of London. It's really easy for me in London to think, oh, yeah, everything's great. We all get together. We can have a good chat. There are challenges every now and then we see on the news um, and we can come together to resolve that. But sometimes it's easy to forget, you know, there's one person in the middle of a very small town um, that feels alone. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is focus on those smaller areas and actually how can we build the momentum in those areas too to help move forward to for people who maybe need it more so than some of the people in the larger cities. Um, we've also sort of had signature events. So one of the things that we're trying to achieve is to one, get Rainbow out there a bit more visibly, but also to work with some of the other networks. So we have networks here around race, um, disability, gender, and so on. So working with those networks, but one of the things that we've been able to achieve this year is get some of our really senior people involved with some of the larger events where we've had some external role models come in. So for example, Tom Daly came in, um, Nicola Adams, and we've had sort of those people to be able to draw people in to talk about this LGBTQ plus inclusion, to get more, you know, build that allyship. Um, and when I talk about allyship as well, I don't just mean non-LGBTQ plus people, I mean also within our own community and how we support each other in the right way. 
the charity element, as I mentioned earlier, was, the charity is quite big. It's really embedded in the core of us as a network. Um, we do things financially. So you'll see here we've raised you know over a hundred thousand um, pounds for charities in different different ways throughout the year. Um, but also we we do things like we encourage people with technical skills to help charities with their website. We um, I do befriending. So Donald, I saw him on Monday. Actually, I see an older LGBT person who suffers from um, loneliness, and I go around sort of over two weeks. So we do lots of different things. Um, someone jumped out of plane the other day. So lots of different things. But we as a network really embedded in in what we are doing. Um, and Rob, who's talking later, is actually doing a drag drag quiz. Um, I don't even know. It might be tonight. Um, but yeah, I know. Doing that to, yeah, to raise to raise money for charity. And then finally, pride. So um, pride is also a really big key thing. So actually, on that topic, if I just move on to my final slide, um, there's lots of things we do around pride, and there's decorating our branches to make sure that we're visible there to get and that helps with conversation inside the branch as well with colleagues that, I mean customers that are coming in and having that conversation um and then on the left hand side you'll see how we've kind of like engaged with our marketing and really bring to life I guess just visibly how we are LGBT um Q plus inclusive so that is a lot of our rainbow so hopefully it just kind of like really brings to life to our network and what we're doing there um, and I am going to pass over to um, someone else <laughs> Joe. oh great thank you thank you and apologies there's an irony for me in this in that I've joined a call with tech expert and my kit has completely let me down this morning so so many apologies that you just hear me on the phone um but thanks, Anthony. Um, and I do have to add to that, even though I'm somewhat biased at Lloyd Banking Group, I love our Rainbow Network. The energy, time and true care that all our members bring as volunteers in their own time is, 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 is inspiring. But that being said, organisations have a role to, part, to play. And that's hopefully what I'll try and bring to life in the next few minutes. So who am I? What do I do? Um, my name's Jo McCann, um, my pronouns are she, her, and for the last eight years, I've been privileged to lead the group's LGBTQ inclusion activity, clearly working very closely with Rainbow, but also across the organisation and wider to help create a welcoming environment for all and a place where everyone can bring their whole self to work. It should never be the sole responsibility of LGBTQ people to lead the change, to make organisations do the right thing or to push organisations to be more inclusive. Some of that responsibility needs to sit with the corporate itself, as harsh as that reality sounds. So hopefully what I'll do is talk through some of the things that we've done at Lloyd Banking Group, where we've got some lessons and things we would have done differently and hopefully give you all some ways that you can help drive better inclusion for your LGBTQ colleagues. So what have we done? We were really, really proud to be the first UK owned organisation to extend our private medical benefit to include gender dysphoria. That essentially means that our colleagues, our scheme members, now have access to the appropriate care, treatment and support depending on their individual needs at the time that they need it most. And that ranges from counselling and diagnosis to gender realignment. Quite moving, actually, as it's been described as life-changing by some colleagues, but actually life-saving from others. This year, we also removed restrictions around outdated assumptions on HIV. So we now ensure that our private medical cover no longer restricts people living with HIV. One answer to that could be somebody that had a HIV undetectable diagnosis 10 years ago suffered a broken leg in a skiing accident or, or an icy curb. They might not have had access to private medical care simply because of their previous diagnosis. We've now removed that restriction. We would continue to use that removal of that restriction to remove myths and stereotyping that HIV is linked solely to the LGBTQ community. In fact, sadly, we know that diagnosis in the UK is high at the moment, 
and new diagnoses are actually higher than other demographics. But we know that it's a topic very close to our LGBTQ community's hearts. And often, as Anthony mentioned, some of our charity relationships, often it's those wonderful charity organisations that help the wider society we all live in. So we will continue to raise awareness, educate and help everyone living with HIV. Like many organisations, we also conduct annual colleague surveys. This is just to understand how our colleagues feel working at Lloyd's. We constantly re review the demographic options offered to colleagues, because if we ask people to confidentially share their personal information, we need to make sure we have the right options. So we've added additional options like pansexuality, asexuality, and across gender and gender identity, trans, non-binary, and gender fluid. HR policies and support available to colleagues, it shouldn't be an additional ask or an add-on. We make sure that LGBTQ life is threaded within all of our policies, right the way from parental leave through to well-being and performance. We do this really by ensuring that the language in our policies is inclusive to all and bringing forward LGBTQ life with examples. For example, in our foster carer support policy, we ensure we mention LGBTQ foster parents. These often simple signals of inclusion mean a huge amount to our colleagues. It means that they're not looking for something separate or different. They want to feel included and valued and able to bring their whole self. We've also ensured other policies like our uniform approach to branch staff is inclusive to all and has additional options to order from other than the binary male or female. That sounds simple. I know it does. And these are simple things that we can all do. But actually, in an organisation the size of Lloyd's, you wouldn't be um, surprised at the amount of conversations that we've had to deliver that. And I'm pleased it's there. We have mental health advocates across the organisation. These are often our rainbow members, allies and volunteers especially trained in how we help people at the times that matter most to them. We've extended our mental health advocates by providing additional training to over 80 volunteers from an LGBTQ charity, supporting in LGBTQ specific mental health. That just means that there's real love, support and signposting at some of the most crucial points that can come in any of our lives. We've added pronouns to our HR systems, teams, email signatures, and name badges for all the staff in our branches. It's purely optional if you choose to display your pronouns. And the reason for that is we would never want to ask someone to inadvertently out themselves or, um, or to choose a pronoun that they weren't comfortable with because they weren't out in their lives. But it is one way that we can signal to people that you're not just welcomed, but you are valued. So I said earlier, there shouldn't be an additional extra policy for LGBTQ colleagues. For us, this needs to be included in all that we do. But there is an exception. We know life experiences, and Anthony and Craig really brought this to life earlier, but life experiences for our trans and non-binary colleagues can be very different from their cisgender peers. Therefore, we've created specific guides for trans and non-binary colleagues, and one for line managers, which talks to the support available, like the healthcare cover I mentioned earlier, through to changing your name and or gender at work, or coming out to your teams. We've also created a trans awareness guide available to all of our approximately 65,000 employees designed to give everyone a basic understanding of gender identity related topics, showcasing best practice and highlighting both as an employer and as major financial service provider, but we sometimes do get it wrong. We've got specially trained people within HR that support line managers and colleagues when someone asks to change their name and or gender at work. 
these specialists will guide people through everything from what legal documentation is required through to navigating our often complex IT systems. I mentioned at the start that it should never be the responsibility of LGBTQ people alone to be the change in society and work. But as organisations, we recognise that we need to create a space where our LGBTQ colleagues feel they're welcome for who they are. And should they choose to become role models, which I know you'll hear from shortly, we need to ensure that we give them the platform to do that, that we don't make changes as cisgendered people or as allies or assumptions for a community without providing that voice. We need to ensure we listen to colleagues and we prioritise the changes that matters most to them. So how do we do this? Well, one way is clearly with Rainbow, a phenomenal um, colleague network that drives a huge amount every day. But another way we can all do this is with leadership from the very top, so our CEO holds listening sessions with colleagues from all different demographics and backgrounds, simply so he can hear what life is like at the bank and what he and his team can do to improve. This year, he held sessions with some of our trans and non-binary colleagues, as we know life can feel very scary for the trans community right now, and with some of our bisexual colleagues, and we've already acted on some of the feedback they shared. We also have executive sponsorship at the top of the organisation. These execs meet regularly with our colleague networks. They show visible support through events and further listening sessions, and they use their seniority to influence across the group on the changes that we need to make. An exec sponsor can also bring people to the topic. Let's be honest, sometimes people join an event or a session because they want to hear or be visible to the boss. That's no bad thing, as when they join and hear the personal stories, in many, many cases, they themselves then go on to champion positive change. So that's some of the things we've done or continue to do. But I thought I'd also mention some of the key learnings that we found over the last seven or eight years. Things that we would perhaps have done differently or that we haven't yet cracked. So that if any of you have any ideas, please do let us know. Um, but I think it's also important just to be honest that the journey isn't complete. We're not there. We don't always get it right, but we do care. So as an organisation, we have hundreds of sites across the UK. With over 65,000 colleagues, we sometimes struggle to communicate all of the things we've done to everyone. We face into challenges on how we can bring this to life and bring people on the journey with us. We still haven't got this right, but we are trying more ways. And similar to communicating, I mentioned we've created awareness guides, but there's more to do in terms of raising awareness and educating people beyond rainbow or beyond those that have a passion for inclusion. So how do we reach those that aren't yet bought in? As a regulated entity, we have mandatory training, and there's always a natural frustration as to why we perhaps don't bring to life more of this through there. But mandatory training can be viewed as forced, as a must-do. So it's a hard balance. Our healthcare, I mentioned before, I'm so proud of our gender dysphoria cover. But in truth, it's still not yet perfect. Access to this depends on a GP referral. And we know that for many people, it's increasingly hard to see a GP. We've also seen wait times increase since the pandemic, even in the private sector. So colleagues can be really frustrated that whilst vast improvements in having private medical care are available to them, there's still waiting time. And it's a painful time for the trans and non-binary community. The dependents under 18 covered by our scheme, due to medical guidelines, they only have access to mental health support. That's great, we thought, when we launched the cover. But this is not provided by a gender specialist. And so in some cases, that has meant that People are themselves upskilling a counsellor on gender identity. It's caused hurt and frustration. So what would I have done differently? Had I known this, which only came to life as people started to use the service, I think we'd have been very clear from the outset to manage expectations, to be very clear what's available, and to sometimes admit to the harsh reality whilst we still push for greater cover and change. So. 
One thing we'll continue to do is listen to the LGBTQ community. We're fortunate to have so many brave role models. Anthony mentioned the role model list and you're gonna hear from a role model shortly. They share themselves, they help create change. But if you and your organization don't feel that you have many out visible LGBTQ colleagues, or that you don't want to put the pressure or rely on them to tell you what to do, there are other ways. Feel free to reach out to your partners like us. But Anthony mentioned our close links with some brilliant LGBTQ charities. It's not just about raising money. For us, we listen to them, we learn from them. By spending your time investing in expertise in a similar way you do in all your training and support packages, you can access a wealth of knowledge to help your own workplaces. So, in summary, and I apologise, again, that I'm on the phone, <laughs> but in summary, we can never underestimate the power of human storytelling. It's people that change cultures, brave, brave role models. But also, for an organisation, we should not be putting too much pressure on those people to be the change. So I'll hand you over to Tom Hegarty now to bring to life the wonderful activity in the space of role models. Thank you, Joe, and morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Tony Hegarty, and my preferred pronouns are she, her. I work as a project manager uh, within Lloyd's Banking Group uh, and was really uh, humbled and proud to be nominated one of the Rainbow Role Models uh, for 2023. Uh, if we just jump on to the next slide. Thank you. So Anthony already touched on um, the two main kind of hashtags, as we're calling them, um, to drive momentum and, and really kind of hone in on the focus uh, of our, our purpose and the um, values and messaging that we're trying to achieve. So I won't go into too much detail on those. You can see them on the screen there, um, the hashtag we are rainbow and hashtag LBG with the T. Um, so a focus on again, momentum as a group um, for rainbow and driving inclusivity. And then a focus specifically on the trans community and how we can drive change and inclusivity both internally and externally. You'll also see uh, a little snapshot of lots of um, happy smiling faces there on the right hand side. Um, so that's some of our role models that were uh, nominated this year. And as Anthony mentioned earlier, um, you know, this is an annual drive. I think having visible LGBTQ plus role models in an organization shows people that it's okay to be your whole self, your authentic self, and to bring that self to work each day. Um, rather than just playing lip service to inclusivity, it actually evidences it by the existence and behaviors of role models and allies alike. The presence of role models should really encourage and hopefully inspire others in the workplace to be more considerate and reflective of their own behaviors and the message that that behavior is ultimately delivering about the values that your organization holds. Uh, so what does being a role model mean? What does it entail? Um, for me, it means being the change that you want to see. You really do have to embody those values day to day. It means being accountable. Uh, we've already mentioned today that it's very easy to slip up um, with the uh, letters, um, particularly when we're LBG. Um, but it really does mean holding yourself to account as well as other people for you know, the, the language that we use, whether it's inclusive, the way that we behave in meetings, the way we treat others. Um, it means recognizing also that everyone holds biases, that you know, no one is perfect um, in this. And we are constantly, language is constantly evolving, you know, the discussion in um, the environment outside of the workforce and inside of the workforce is constantly evolving. Um, so uh, recognize that we do all have uh, individual biases and those are things that we need to be cognizant of when we interact with others and try to bring these values to life. And it also means then owning your learning journey, you know, not embracing ignorance, um, really trying to put your first foot, uh, your best uh, foot forward and educate yourself as well as others. Practice developing empathy for others. So I love that phrase, um, uh, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Um, uh, definitely put yourself in their position. 
um, and, and try to uh, make sure that you're always creating that empathy, holding that empathy when you consider how words, actions, and also um, you know the behaviours of others impact people in the workforce. And then finally, getting comfortable being uncomfortable. So conversations about inclusivity and equity can be uncomfortable, um, but they're really important, uh, particularly when it comes to creating a safe space where, again, everyone feels comfortable to bring their whole selves, to be their best selves, and to openly discuss the challenges that they face, both in the workplace and externally. Um, you know, it's only by kind of doing that that we can actually start to overcome those challenges. Uh, so just to summarize, you know, uh, as has already been mentioned in a couple of sections um, today by our presenters, role models have power. They have the power to inspire, to energize and to bring the rest of your workforce along on the journey to LGBTQ plus inclusivity and equity. So by harnessing that power, you not only recognize those colleagues that are already embodying these values in an engaging and positive way, but you're also making a statement. You're making a statement about what your organization believes in and you know, ultimately increasing the likelihood that those beliefs, those values will embed and evolve, evolve uh, within your organization. Hi, so I'm Flo McCubbin. My pronouns are they, them, or he, him. Um, I am a data engineer for Lloyd's Banking Group. I've been working in technology on and off pretty much my whole life with my first job starting off in email marketing, working in the back ends, uh, proceeding on to working in app development, uh, back ends of wine systems, and eventually doing a data analysis apprenticeship for Lloyd's Banking Group. Being non-binary and bisexual and out of work, I never actually thought that much about it until I joined Lloyd's. I'd always worked for really small tech organizations, very boys club, but they were always very accepting of me. And then I got to Lloyd's and I was like, oh, wow, I'm faced with this massive organization. How do I be myself in this space when I'm still getting to know the ropes and learning a new career? And I found the Rainbow Network and as part of the Rainbow Network, I joined the trans community working group and I've been able to not only come out at work, but advocate for issues of non-binary people. Um, when I first joined, I wasn't really sure where to go, what to do, how to present. And now I've been able to work on things such as helping the call centers uh, use pronouns correctly by developing some of their processes. I had the pleasure of being a part of the call with Charlie Nunn and generally i found that simply by being out and talking about my experiences and issues of being non-binary for instance access to toilets in the workplace that suit my gender identity and things like that i've been able to not only make change but get a platform with people who can make further changes than i can so by giving the leg up to people, not only in education, in technology that don't necessarily have a traditional route, but also listening to their voices and their needs, you can make greater change in your organization from places you wouldn't necessarily expect. I will pass on to Chloe. Thanks, Flo. Um, hi there, everyone. Oh, you're on mute, Chloe. Apologies. Uh, hi there, everyone. Uh, my name's Chloe. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm a trans feminine uh, colleague working at the bank. So my experience in tech, I've been, I've worked in tech on and off um, for about a decade now. Um, my first job in tech, I worked long before I came out as uh, a tech support uh, agent at a small IT company. And back then my experiences with tech are very different from how they are now my experiences back then were very tech is a, a boys club it's it can be quite misogynistic and you have to kind of be one of the boys to kind of to progress in that career and and those were my experiences and i remember one of the times <clears throat> one christmas um my boss as a secret santa gift got me a little black book as a uh 
as a, as as a, it's like a, a thing. He was like, it's for writing down the numbers of any girls that you might be seeing at the time and stuff like that. And it's very misogynistic and not not particularly uh, not particularly fun, especially when you're quietly dealing with your own kind of sexuality and gender identity issues in the background and you're having to hide that from work. Um, moving on further into my career when I joined Lloyd's. Uh, and then moving back into tech roles because for a while I was working in one of our call centers and moving back into tech and I found the atmosphere's totally changed these days. Um, at least for me, I've noticed it's a lot more accepting, a lot more. Um, it's, it's kind of it lets you celebrate who you are a lot more. That's my that's been my experiences since coming out. Um, within Lloyd's is that it's a lot more. Um welcoming atmosphere uh, especially in tech roles uh, and i'm sure that's not the, the case across the board but it's certainly been my experiences um so it's uh, definitely a testament to the kind of the inclusion that's the practices that goes on the lines and like flow i've been able to get involved in like all the different different initiatives to support trans colleagues as well um, and with that i'll pass over to lauren Thanks, Chloe. Um, yeah, so a um, bit like uh, Flo Anglo, I've been in data pretty much my whole career. Self-confessed data nerd, firmly believe it's hit to be square. I was recently asked what my dream job title would be, and I chose Enchantress of Numbers. Um, but in reality, my name is Lauren Wright, and my, my less cool job title is um, Head of Data Advanced Analytics and Insight, which I affectionately refer to as DAI because I'm a middle-aged goth and that's what happens when you let someone like me make up their own team name. Um, and the myth I want to try and bust today is that uh, people who skirt around or don't talk about LGBTQ plus identity don't want to talk about it when they feel safe to do so. Um, it's actually that sometimes they can't or, or they don't feel safe. So I guess a little bit about my identity. I am pansexual and my preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, as an aside, I am also disabled and neurodiverse. Um, and I've often been a lone woman in tech. I present as female, and as long as I can remember, especially early in my career, I've been wheeled out a lot as a, as a woman in tech. I still remember showing up to my advanced maths course at uni and wondering where all the females went after Ooh. attending an all-girls school. Um, and when I say rolled out, I don't think the intent was meant to be negative. It was positive, but it could sometimes feel a little bit awkward, like tokenism or I was some kind of, of sideshow. And probably not helped by the fact that my mom always says to me, and not my sister, I might add, who also works in the bank, that I don't look like a banker. Um, and that was one thing I felt I couldn't control, that presenting as female or protect, whereas my sexuality and my disability, because neither are visible, were part of myself that I could keep for me or when I felt comfortable. And it wasn't that I wasn't out or proud of who I was, because I was, but there were, they were aspects of my personality that I didn't volunteer and, and as I said, there was a trust element, as many of us have, right? But protected groups, no matter what they are, there will be examples that we hear every day or experience ourselves of people being treated differently because of nothing more than who they are and who they identify as. Mm -hmm. But also, if I'm being really honest amongst friends, I was a bit exhausted of the pressure I felt frustrated as in my mind, my ability to do my job had nothing to do with the boxes that I ticked. Um, and but as I went into leadership and the organisation and my roles and responsibilities, as well as my team grew, I started to talk more openly with my team because I felt I felt safe with them. And to my delight and surprise, I had unconsciously attracted a diverse bunch. So they, they do say you attract your tribe, right? Uh, but 30 percent of my leadership team identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and ironically, we've been working together for a long time until we realised and that's led to learning on, on growth and growth on subjects from conversion therapy to reciprocal IVF, which which two of my LT have been through. But it, it made me realise that the boxes that I tick absolutely do make me the leader I am and who I am, but in the best way. And therefore, where I felt comfortable to do so, I need to shout about that, the good, the bad. So others who felt like I did or feel like I did can see they're not alone. Um, so, yeah, I guess being out and proud at work isn't just good for me personally, but it's good for others. Um, and to use Anthony's term, my, my new gay job is I'm deputy co-chair of the Rainbow Network, so I can be more out and present. It's really scary. A lot of my role models have talked on this call and, you know, you get that imposter syndrome of what can I add that these wonderful people aren't already. Uh, but we need as many people as possible to make the broadest difference. Hi, my name is Rob. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, and I'm co-leader of the Allies stream within the Rainbow Network. Um, I'm going to be very quick because we don't have long left. Um, my my story of allyship started as being just gay friendly because my brother had come out when I was very young um, 
and my, I turned to active ally when a colleague of mine came out again when someone new started the team and I realized that coming out isn't something you do once and I thought it's not fair on him because he was nervous of telling this person because they were slightly older and couldn't tell whether they're going to be receptive or not so at that point I decided to become an active ally um, and if you drop down a slide I just want to define ally it's easy I don't do much reading of, or very often there you go take actions big or small to advance the equality of a marginalized group they're not part of I am not a member of the LGBTQ plus community I am an ally of everyone under all those acronyms, all, all of those letters. Um, if we move that down again, please. Um, so <laughs> as has been said already on this call, it it's not my, my brother when he came out, it's not his job to tell me what all of the gays think. It's not his job to come and tell me uh, what I should be thinking. It's my job as an ally to go and ask the question. And it might be my brother I ask, it might be someone else in the organization I ask, but it's my curiosity. And then once I've got that knowledge, it's me that needs to then make sure I pass that knowledge on to everyone else around me. Um, I also shouldn't be shouting over the top of people. It's not my job to do that. Uh, and I don't want to take away the struggle and the recognition of the struggle from those that have stepped before me. Um, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to upset some people. Um, but do it in the right way and with the respect. Um, and it's uncomfortable for a little while, but you're going to have to do that. That's been said before me. Get used used to being uncomfortable um, and when you make a mistake and I have done um, and, and I've been doing this for quite a while and I'm still making mistakes and I was out last night with members of steering and I still got pointed at some very interesting points that I had missed before um, apologize um, mean it act upon it and move on and I shall cut that quiet that'll be done two minutes how's that winning that was amazingly whistle stop Rob you packed a lot of um, a lot of important content there into into a very short space of time. Um, we have had a few questions in that we are going to reply back to um, those folks who sent those questions in. We'll get back to you directly, um, such as angles like um, how to get started if you're in an SME, um, how can you make LGBTQ inclusion work globally, especially if you've got different legislation in different regions. And we'd like to talk a little bit more about trans healthcare as well, the fantastic work that Joe was mentioning earlier. So um, what we'll do is we will drop in some further content in the notes to this recording, which we'll put below. Um, but for now, I would just like to say thank you so much to Lloyd's Banking Group, to all of the speakers who have kindly and passionately put time in to coming up with their distilled learnings and insights about this and what the messages they really think that business leaders need to be hearing about this. To find out more about what you can do for LGBTQ plus inclusion in your business, no matter what your size, um, please look at the Tech Talent Charter's free resources in the DNI Open Playbook, which include some of the fantastic uh, resources that have been mentioned on this call. They have been very kindly shared by Lloyd's Banking Group so that we can share them with you. Um, and do sign up to our free monthly newsletter in which we will include any new updates to the Open Playbook. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and have a lovely rest of your day, folks.